Our Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings upon your word. God, make your message powerful and clear. God, help us to be able to have understanding that we've never had. Lord, open our hearts, God, that we can receive the truth. And God, help us in our hearts, Lord, to come firm on the foundation that you've laid. Lord, as we study the birth of the church, the foundation of everything that we are, God, the ministry that was accomplished after the day of Pentecost, when the church was born of the power of God. Lord, we ask that you bless it and help our understanding to grow. Lord, and increase our knowledge, and God, increase our passion to know. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bible says, He that hungereth and thirsteth after righteousness, the same shall be filled. If you want to know more about the Lord, you got to seek Him. Well, we thank the Lord for you. I love you very much. Uh, we've been studying the, the birth of the church. Uh, I hope that we have accomplished this one thing, that there has been no confusion and, and I keep the door open if you ever have questions about any part I want you to ask it and you don't have to feel bad about asking it because my dad used to make me feel real bad he said I, I just wish you would shut up sometime son and, and I'd say dad if I don't ask how am I ever going to know and he'd just look at me he, <laughs> he didn't have an answer for that one but the Bible says that if we hunger and we thirst, let me tell you, there is no meal. We, we have to eat physically, but there is no meal like God's meal. Amen. When you come to the place where God can feed your hungry heart and satisfy you to the depths, there's nothing like it. So uh, as we've studied, we've seen the birth of the church. We've seen how that the family of God was the greatest enemy of the early church. The house of Israel was the greatest force that the apostles fought against. The Roman government had the power to kill, but the Sanhedrin court had the power to give judgment. And after they would give judgment, they would take God's children and they would put them in jails and in prisons. They would beat them. There was no repercussions for that. And they would do everything they could. And we found that out all through the life of Apostle Peter, of Philip, uh, of John. We found that all the way through Paul's life. Now, Paul's ministry is... Uh, in his final stage we've studied the first two missionary journeys that Apostle Paul took we've tried to use this little television here one of these days I hope we get our system finished but we've said just imagine that to be the, the Mediterranean Sea or the Great Sea and over here is is where Israel is it's just a little tiny piece of God's earth right here is the Gaza Strip just a little tiny and then right around it is Israel and you got the West Bank right above it you got Lebanon you got Syria over here you got Jordan down here you you've got uh, Lebanon to the north and you've got Russia out there and then on over through Asia over in this area if you come around the top of the Mediterranean Sea you would see where the Adrian Sea uh, kind of goes up by Greece and then you see how the sea continues and comes up between Greece and Corinth that we've tried to teach about and you'll find Italy is over here where Rome is now that's where Apostle Paul will be going next and uh, so if you can imagine that in your mind uh, I'd like to say to you that uh, Apostle Paul has already completed two missionary journeys in which God called him uh, to take the gospel to all of Israel, to Judea, and out to Samaria, and it just kept branching. He's took it up into Europe and Asia. He's done a great ministry as we've been 
teaching here on his third missionary journey. But Apostle Paul, as we study in the next little bit, is going to come to the end of his journeys. He'll come to the end of his third journey, which is his last. He wants to go back to Jerusalem to have one last Passover. He is going to leave the church. Uh, I thought about that as I was preparing tonight. It would be a, a, a most dramatic and a sad thing if I knew tonight would be the last time I would see any of you all. And uh, I would think probably that your heart would be saddened if you knew this was the last time you would hear me speak. Well, as we're studying here tonight, that's what's happening with the church. Apostle Paul has been through all of these villages and areas. He has preached the gospel. He sent out Timothy and Silas and all of these, Philip and all of these to minister in the churches. But he's got to accomplish, and as he's into this uh, uh, portion of his life, he knows he's kind of like Christ when Christ was taking his last journey to Jerusalem. The Bible says that he set his face steadfastly towards Jerusalem. He knew he had to go to Golgotha. He knew that he had to die for us to ever be saved. Well, Apostle Paul knows the same thing. God called him on the road to Damascus and he told him, these two reasons have I called you. The first was to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. But the second is the hardest of all. There was a lot of hurt, a lot of beating, a lot of persecution, a lot of suffering that Apostle Paul had to do. But God wanted to show the church, and if you don't get anything else out of all the teaching that I've been trying to do about Apostle Paul, pay close attention to how much he suffered for the cause of Christ. And then put yourself in a position as God's child and understand that we might have to suffer time sometime so that the gospel may be carried forth. Sometimes our God leads us to a special place. And that's why it's so special that we've got these ministries starting in our church. Because every one of these ministries will cause, will, will demand sacrifice of our own personal lives. They'll demand a giving up. They'll demand of picking up the cross that Christ told us to bear and to carry it forward. As we're here on this uh, portion of Scripture, we're in the last journey that Apostle Paul will make throughout the churches. I think probably here in this last phase on this third missionary journey is probably where the seven churches of Asia was born. When John the Revelator went to the Isle of Patmos, God gave him the revelation that we've taught on. It took a little over a year for us to teach on that book. But as, as John went to the Isle of Patmos and God gave him the message to the seven churches, which represented the church age and the church ages, God showed John what things would be. But Apostle Paul is the one that evangelized these areas and preached the word of God, even though it cost him to be beat many times. It caused him to be rejected everywhere he went. It caused the family of God that hated Jesus, that crucified Jesus, it caused them to come down upon him. And, uh, you know, sometimes your greatest enemies on earth will be your family. And let me say this, sometimes the greatest enemy of the church are the members from within. Most of the trouble that I've seen in my years in the church, it's not been caused by a drunk down the street. It's not been caused by somebody that done bad things in the community. The trouble in the church has in the majority of times been caused by brothers and sisters that gets out of the spirit and does things out of a wrong heart. You know, the devil tempts everybody. And, and I hope that you've seen this as we've taught that many times because of the blessings of God and the growth of the church, 
That's when those that were supposed to love God more than anybody that had the eternal and earthly promises of God to his family, the house of Israel, they are the ones that fought against Jesus more than anybody. So we've got to understand, yes, we may go against the grain and we may be like a fish swimming uphill, but one of these days we'll have the job done. We're the ones that's going to finish this thing out. The church will be finished in our time. Jesus said, when you see these things and no generation has ever seen them, like we've seen them. Israel came back to her homeland in my lifetime. I was born the year that our country, by God's help, gave Israel the open door to come back to Canaan. She's back. She's been fought by every enemy that could come against her, but they've never been able to defeat her. And the reason is, is because God has a plan. And God has power. And right now when all of the nations are gathering against Israel, the whole world, you, nobody's ever seen the scriptures told us about it. But no generation has seen what Jesus shared with his disciples before he left. And let me tell you something, children. We've seen it. And we're seeing it. It's happening right now. These nations that God said he would draw down against Israel. And they would think that they were going to destroy Israel. And that's what they think right now. If it were not for America right now, they would have already blowed Israel off the face of the earth. But I say that to say this. Whether God used a miracle, America, or whoever God used, they could never do it and they never will. Amen? Why? Because God gave Israel promises that will be fulfilled. The promises to Israel are earthly promises. I want you to understand that as Apostle Paul went through all these areas, through Asia Minor, through Europe, after spending all this time in Ephesus, where there was such an evil, idol-worshipping, vulgar society, a very sinful people that worshipped this many-breasted God uh, that was a meteorite that fell out of God's heaven, out of the firmament, and fell to the earth, and they turned it and carved it into this uh, very vulgar image of who Diane was. And they created a God that all of the world at that time came there to worship. They come in there by the uh, multitudes and worship. They wanted to get there. They built the, uh, at that time, one of the seven wonders of the world in this big temple of Diane. It was, it was a colossal thing. But Apostle Paul has been there the last couple of years preaching the gospel and God opened the door while all of these evil idol worshiping people, they had a kind of like the Mexicans, they took two or three hours off in the afternoon as history teaches us. That's when Apostle Paul was granted the permission to speak about Jesus. And it didn't go without suffering. It didn't go without hurt. Apostle Paul suffered greatly for it. But Apostle Paul is just about at his last sufferings for God. But we're going to read here in this scripture as we get ready to teach. We're going to read that his, Paul is, his sufferings are not finished yet. So as we start reading, I want you to, uh, I want to back up because I want you to understand this. That I said last week, when you deal with people's monies, you can get on the wrong side really easy. And that's what happened as Apostle Paul preached uh, about Jesus Christ to these idol-worshipping uh, God, false God-worshipping people. 
there was a man called Demetrius, and I'm going to read it, and then we'll get into the study. But here in the 24th verse of the 19th chapter, it says, For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, he molded things out of silver, he melted it, he designed it. It says, Which made silver shrines for Diana, or this false god, he brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupations and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. So there was a whole bunch of them. And they, I guess they probably couldn't make these little shrines fast enough for the demand of the people. But it said here, Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia. It said, This Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. Welcome. Bless your heart. It says here, Apostle Paul told them, these don't have the power of a God. They're man-made. There is no virtue in them. There is but one true and living God. He said, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught or nothing, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised. Or in other words, that people would, would be converted and then there would be nobody to uh, praise this false god, Diana. And it would come to know the tourists would stop. People would stop coming there. Well, it says... And her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. So right there is very clear that uh, she drew a multitude of people which brought financial gain to this city called Ephesus. And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath, or in other words, they got mad and angry. And they turned against Paul and they cried out saying, Great is Diana of Ephesus. And I think if we could properly interpret that, we'd be saying, Jesus is bad. You don't want to hear him. We want to praise Diana. And let me bring your minds to an earthly position that we stand in. That's exactly what the world's doing to all of us. Amen. It wants us to demean the name of Christ. There's never been, ever in my lifetime, ever been such demeaning, vulgar talk of Jesus Christ as there has been in the last year. Our media, our social networks, they have demeaned the name of Jesus to the very lowest levels. From having uh, men set up on top of men's shoulders that pretended to be Christ naked before the people like they were uh, having some kind of an affair with Jesus Christ to demean him and to bring him down. That's happened in our streets. They have mocked his name in front of our city buildings. They have destroyed the name of Jesus in every way they can. They've cried out, destroy Israel from the face of the earth. Get rid of her. Free Palestine from Israel. Let me tell you something, children. Today, we have lived to see the most degrading things that have been done against Jesus and his people. I said Sunday that uh, in this Nicaraguan country, this one little country, there was over 5,000 Christians killed in this last year. 5,000 that were beheaded, cut in pieces, destroyed, beaten. They took their life away because they spoke the name of Jesus. That's in one little communist country. Right now, they have captured a lot of these missionaries that were down there 
trying to preach Jesus Christ and they're holding them hostage right now while we have the liberty to worship. They are holding them hostage and they will kill them also. Unless God intervenes in some miraculous way, they will kill them. Let me say, let me say to you, children, we're living in the very last hours of time. We're living in the closing out of the grace dispensation. Yes. I don't know the hour. I don't know the day. But I know every uh, statement that the Bible has told us that would be here. And we are the only generation that has ever seen these. We've heard about them. You've got people that mocked, and the Bible says they would. They've scorned the very name of Jesus, and they've said, His coming's not going to really happen. He's never going to come. Well, let me tell you, children, that is so foolish. I would not want to be standing where they stand, because we have seen... Read the Word of God. Read about the prophecies. Read about what is going to happen in this generation. And Jesus Himself, the Son of God, said this generation shall not pass. The strongest word in the English language is the word shall. You can say it will not happen and there's a possibility that maybe it wouldn't. But if you say shall, and that's what God's brothers, when they interpreted this into the American language in the 1600s and gave us a Bible that we could read ourselves that wasn't in Arabic or Hebrew, he said, this generation shall not pass till all things be fulfilled. Jesus said, I never came to judge any of you. You know, we've all lived our lives. We've all sinned. We've all done a lot of bad things. But thank God when you come to Jesus, His precious blood covers every stain of sin. His blood that He shed on Calvary atones for our sin. And, and let me tell you something, children. We become new inside. Amen? How many of you feel new inside? You have the love of Jesus in your heart. Well, let's read on here a little bit. It said, When they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia that had come down with Paul, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed them with one accord into the theater. They captured them, they pushed them into the theater, and it says that when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. They wouldn't let him come in because they knew that they would kill him. And God wasn't finished with Apostle Paul. It said, And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. They were so confused, they didn't know even why they were there, but they rushed in there, and they were getting ready to do some of the great things we see done here on our streets. They were going to kill Paul, they were going to kill Gaius, they were going to cure, cure, uh, kill Aristotle. They, uh, it said they drew Alexandra out of the multitude and the Jews putting him forward, putting him out front. He was the first one they were going to be mean to. It said Alexander beckoned with his hand and would have made his defense unto the people. So I take it that he was not able to, but he would have told them why he loved Jesus and said when they knew that he was a Jew all with one voice about the space of two hours they cried out great is Diane of Ephesus so inside that theater when they brought him forward to make an example of him and I'm sure possibly they may have even killed him. I don't know that. The scripture doesn't bear that out. 
But what they done was tortured him for two hours, screaming out how great this false goddess of Diane, which was a fallen meteorite from Jupiter, and they had carved it into a many-breasted god, false god, that they all came from all over Europe and Asia to worship. It said when the town clerk had appeased the people, in other words, he calmed the situation down and told them things they needed to hear to kind of calm down. It said, you men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that this city of Ephesus is a worshiper of the great goddess Diane? He said, we all know how great she is. He said, all of you know this. And of the image which fell down from Jupiter, seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, in other words, nobody's allowed to speak against this false goddess, ye ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. He's saying, calm down. We all know who she is and we know who they are. It's not going to accomplish anything if we do something rashly. For ye have, wrought, ye have brought hither these men which are neither robbers of churches nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen, they're the ones that got it all started. They're the ones that made all these images and made lots of money doing it. Which are with him have a matter against any man. The law is open. And there are deputies, let them implead one another. In other words, he's saying, if it's a matter of some of these Christians doing something unlawful, then we have a Roman government that controls this thing. Let's just take them to court and deal with it. But we're not going to do anything here today. God was with them. But he said, but if you inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. He said, we're going to do this thing lawfully. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar. There be no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. In other words, he's saying the leaders of Rome, Herod, whichever one was in power at that time, whether it was Claudius or Nero or whoever it was, we know that Nero is the one that gave the commandment to take Paul's head off not many days later. I don't know when they when he was in power or whatever, but he's saying we got to be careful what we do here today because we're going to have to answer to Herod. You see, uh, they were bound by laws, even though they had the power and were given powers to kill and to do all these things. They had to make sure it was okay with the king. It said, and when they had spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Now I want you to go on over into the next chapter and we're going to go just a little piece into this chapter. Because Apostle Paul has had the opportunity to preach his last message to the disciples. He will be leaving the church. He will never again hold their hands. He will never again hug their necks. He will never again preach the gospel of Christ. His ministry is over. And he's wanting to go to Jerusalem. But because of the threat that he has upon his life. And he knows that he has to go to Rome. He decides to turn back up and go back up into Macedonia. Into southern Europe. And go around that away. Well, what he does, he comes over and he comes back down by the church of Ephesus one more time to Melita. Melita was the big port that brought in all of the, the uh, harbor uh, deliveries and all and made Ephesus so great. They had such a great uh, harbor there and it was right there at Ephesus. But I'm saying all of this so that you might get a vision and might get an idea of what's taking place here. But it says here, 
that after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed to go unto Macedonia. In other words, instead of going by the sea, he decides to go back up the coastline and go back up into southern Europe. And when he had gone over these parts and had given them much exhortation, he came unto Greece again there at Athens where he had been before. And there abode three months. He was there three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him as he was about to sail into Syria, he proposed to return through Macedonia. In other words, whenever he was up here at Greece and he was going to come down through the great Mediterranean Sea and go back over here to Syria, because of the threat and understanding what was going to happen, he goes back up and goes into southern Europe into Macedonia and goes around the land uh, for a piece there and comes back down through Ephesus one more time. But it says here, and there uh, accompanied him, uh, the Jews have been waiting, and there accompanied him in Asia, Sopater and Berea, and of the Thessalonians, or in other words, from the Thessalonian church that had been born, Articus and Secandus and Gaius and Derby and Timotheus, which was Timothy, the pastor that he left behind, and of Asia, Tychus and Trophimus, these going before they tarried for us at Troas. They were going to have their last meeting there. It said, and we sailed away from Philippi, where the Philippian church was, after the days of the unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days. Took five days to get there by land, where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, which would have been on a Sunday, we know that the last day of their week was on a Saturday. It started Friday evening, the Jewish Sabbath. Uh, started on Saturday evening. I mean, started on Friday evening. Uh, Saturday being the seventh day. Uh, it started Friday evening at 6 o'clock and lasted throughout the day of Saturday till 6 o'clock on Saturday evening. That was their Sabbath. But the first day of the week would have started at 6 o'clock on Saturday evening and went through Sunday till 6 o'clock. So that you might have a good understanding there. It says when the disciples came together to break bread, they were going to have communion. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow and continue his speech. He continued his speech until midnight. Now, you can read ahead if you want a little bit. Uh, I'm going to close right here. You're going to find out that Paul preaching his last message to them, it was a long message, lasted up into the night. It was not a time of rejoicing. It was a time of hearing about Jesus for the last time that Apostle Paul would ever speak to them about it. Children, let me say this to you and then we'll close. Every one of us will have our last visit with the body of Christ. Isn't it a wonderful thing we get to share our lives together? Isn't it wonderful for the great cause in which we worship? Isn't it wonderful for the fellowship that we have one with another? Isn't it wonderful the love that we feel one towards the other? Well, Apostle Paul had worked so hard. He had labored so long, but his labors were over. This was his last journey. And he was fleeing from the Jews that wanted to kill him, going back up through Macedonia and southern Europe, back over, and then he came down by Greece and Ephesus again. But let me say to you, as you read this next little bit, remember they've had a lot of them that have come together. Apostle Paul has called them to come and meet with him because this would be the charge. You know, I think about it sometimes. We started this little church. We had no idea what God was going to do, the great things that he's done. But we started this little church by faith. 
I, what a wonderful experience it's been. But I think about Apostle Paul as he's called all these brothers, these pastors, these workers in the church to come and be with him because he knows this will be his last message to them. And children, let me tell you something. We're all on a journey. It's not a sad journey, but it may become a hard journey for some of you. I can't stand up here. You know, I've, I've heard some of these preachers get up and say, if you've got faith, you can do anything. If you've got faith, you're not going to be sick. If you've got faith, you're not going to... I've always said that's not in God's Word. Because God's Word says there's going to be a lot of suffering. Apostle Paul, the greatest part of his ministry was to suffer to show us how great God was. He had to take the gospel and he was faithful. But the greatest part of his ministry was getting beat, getting persecuted, getting mistreated everywhere he went. It was not easy. He didn't have the liberty to get up and speak like I do here in this church. It was under a lot of persecution, but he was faithful. But Apostle Paul, when they meet at Troas, this will be the last time that he'll ever be with these brothers. It's a very, very emotional portion of Scripture. If you want to read ahead, uh, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. But I'd like to say as I'm finishing up here this evening, when you chose Jesus and you realized that His precious blood would cover your sins and by your faith you turned to Him and repented of your sins, you turned away from your sins, you were born into the church. You don't join the church. You're born into the church. You have to repent of your sins. You have to turn away from your sinful life. And by faith, you have to turn towards God. And you have got to understand that you have to come through Jesus. Jesus said, I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. If you want the truth from God, you've got to come through Jesus. But children, we're just about to the end of our journeys. I say this with great anticipation. It's not a sad message. Bless your little heart. The suffering's about over. Amen. The glory is just about to be revealed. The coming of the Lord, the very next thing that will take place, notorious of what God has told us, will be the rapture of the church. The church will be caught away. Paul said to the Thessalonian church, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which sleep in the Lord. Let me tell you something, children. It's getting close, and I'm getting excited. How about you? Let us stand. Our Heavenly Father, bless your people. Bless our church. God, em, em, embrace our hearts with these truths. God, give us a hunger that won't be satisfied till we see you. Lord, give us the strength we need for everyday living. Give us the faith, Lord, to complete our journey. And Lord, help us along the way to take your gospel in faithfulness, even though it causes suffering to those that are lost. In Jesus' name, amen.